James and Miriam Slaw, do you give your blessing to this marriage? We do. And Dave and Dana Penninga, do you give your blessing to this marriage? Family and friends of James and Hannah, welcome to this wedding ceremony. Uh, what a beautiful occasion in which two lives will be knit together as one in the covenant and the commitment of marriage. We thank God for leading James and Hannah together, and we ask him to bless this very special day. Let's begin by singing the first song in the program, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. As we begin the ceremony, let's pray for God's blessing. May I lead you in an opening prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in leading James and Hannah to one another. We thank you for their parents, their families, their churches, their friends. In these relationships, you have raised and nurtured them into a true and living faith in Jesus Christ, their Savior. And you have given them a willingness to commit to the covenant of Christian marriage. What a beautiful day you have given today on which they will pledge faithfulness to one another in the strength and the promise of your faithfulness to them. We pray that this wedding and more importantly, their marriage would give them great joy and would give you great glory. Give James and Hannah all they need today and forever to fulfill their vows with steadfast commitment. May they be a living example of the love of Christ and the church. We pray for your richest blessings on this day. May all our celebrations give us a taste of the great wedding feast which we anticipate 
with eager longing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James and Hannah have chosen Hebrews 10, verse 23 as their wedding passage. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews. We'll first of all read a few verses from Hebrews 4, and then a few more from Hebrews 10. Hebrews 4, and we'll read verses 14 to 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then we'll turn to chapter 10 and we'll read verses 19 to 25. And there we read, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So again, the specific text we'll focus on is verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. James and Hannah, family and friends, in his famous book, Tortured for Christ, Richard Wormbrand relates how he first got into trouble with the regime in Romania shortly after the communists took power in 1944. I'll read a quotation from the book and then we'll see what it has to do with Christian marriage. So I quote, the communists convened a congress of all Christian bodies in our parliament building. There were 4,000 priests, pastors, and ministers of all denominations. And these men of God chose Joseph Stalin as honorary president of this congress. At the same time, he was president of the world movement of the godless and a mass murderer of Christians. One after another, bishops and pastors arose and declared that communism and Christianity are fundamentally the same and could coexist. One minister after another said words of praise towards communism and assured the new government of the loyalty of the church. And then this part, my wife and I were present at this Congress. As Sabina told me, Richard, stand up and wash away this, face, this shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting in his face. I said to her, if I do so, you lose your husband. She replied, I don't wish to have a coward as a husband. Then I rose and spoke to this Congress, praising not the murderers of Christians, but Jesus Christ, stating that our loyalty is due first to him. This is a moving incident, and we learn something in it about Christian marriage. First, I think we see something of the roles in Christian marriage. James and Hannah discussed this with me or we discussed this together a bit in pre-marriage counseling. And um, the role of a husband was, was uh, described as, quote, the glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. The glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. What this refers to is 
the husband joyfully taking upon himself the responsibility of a man to lead, to protect, to provide, to suffer, uh, to be a man like Christ in the home and in the world. Uh, what does this mean practically in daily life? Sometimes it can be hard to put a finger on what it means, but we see something of it in the bold stance of Richard Wormbrandt on the day of that conference. And we also see it in the comment of Sabina fulfilling her God-given calling. The role of a Christian wife is often described with a single word, the word help meet. That's taken from the King James Version of Genesis 2 verse 20. And this word doesn't refer to a helper in a derogatory or belittling way or a slavish way, but it describes the God-given calling to complement and assist her husband, to support him as a leader and a protector and a provider and a sufferer and a Christ-like man. In their different roles, husband and wife work shoulder to shoulder, each embracing the particular shape of uh, what God has designed for them in marriage. So that's something of what we see in this account, but we also see something else. We see something of the purpose of Christian marriage. Now, of course, there's more than one purpose to marriage, but as we'll read later in the form, I quote, husband and wife shall live together in sincere love and holiness, helping each other faithfully in all things that belong to this life and the life to come. And I stress that last part, the life to come. Husband and wife are together for a journey, and the destination is not simply a fine house with a white picket fence and a passel of kids running around in the backyard. Now, of course, the house would be a great blessing, as would be the little ones. The Bible is clear on the blessing of children. But the point is that the purpose of marriage stretches far beyond that. It's greater and longer and farther reaching. It stretches into the life to come. Husband and wife are to be faithful to one another and to assist one another on their journey into eternity. And Sabina Wormbrand knew that. Her eyes were so set on it that she was able to let go. Her goal was not ultimately to hold her husband to herself at all costs. She knew that the purpose of their marriage was greater. The name of Christ, the hope of eternal life were more precious to her than her marriage even the earthly circumstances of her beloved husband. And this lengthy introduction brings us to the wedding text again. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is a very appropriate wedding text. There's a, a calling to hold fast hope, to eternal hope, even and especially within marriage. But then there's also the promise that God is faithful. And this is the foundation for a marriage that perseveres and a marriage that thrives. Today, James and Hannah are going to promise to be faithful to each other. But the faithfulness of James and Hannah is not the foundation. No, they found their marriage on the bedrock foundation of the promises of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their faithfulness is not going to sustain their marriage ultimately. It's going to be God's faithfulness that gives them the strength that they need to be faithful to one another. The strength they need to fulfill their vows in good days and bad, in riches and poverty, in health and sickness, for as long as they both shall live. The calling of Hebrews 10 verse 23 is to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let's briefly zoom out um, to look at the point of Hebrews as a whole, and then we'll zoom back in to this section and then to this verse. The main message of Hebrews is basically a call to perseverance in hard times. And it's likely that the readers were facing uh, a bunch of different trials, but central to them all, it seems that it, there was this pressure to fall away from Christ and to go back into Judaism, um, again, due to, to persecution. Uh, they were tempted to drift away from Christ and even to publicly renounce Christ. And therefore, the book of Hebrews has all kinds of very strong callings from the author to them. So a selection, they're called to pay attention to what they have heard, to fix their minds on Jesus, 
to hold on to their confidence, to examine their hearts, to endure hardship, to strengthen their commitment, to not miss out on the grace of God. And we could go on, actually. The whole letter is full of these callings or exhortations. As one author puts it rightly, the calling to the Christians is to persevere in faith. The calling is faithfulness. But how does the author of Hebrews encourage their faithfulness? Well, mainly by focusing their attention on the glorious realities of the faithfulness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is, what he has done for us. And this is really important also in a marriage as we pursue the callings of our marriages. The calls for us to be faithful, they rest upon the realities of God's faithfulness. First comes the gospel and then comes the command. God has done so much for us in Jesus. He's promised so much, and He is faithful. And therefore, we receive the calling to be faithful as well. Let's zoom back in first to uh, verses 19 to 21 of chapter 10. I'll read those again. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, uh, we should notice the word therefore, uh, considering what has come before, or because of what has already been said, now here's a result, here's a consequence. So these three verses, 19 to 21, are basically a summary of the entire book so far, a real snapshot summary of what he's been saying all along. And therefore, based upon the realities that he's been describing, of Jesus Christ and what he has done, now he's going to give them this calling. We should all also notice that we have tabernacle imagery, temple imagery. So we have the imagery of the holy places where God chose to dwell with his people Israel of old in a very special way. And now these holy places were not open to everyone at all times. Only the priests were allowed to go into the holy places and only the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place and that once a year with the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of the sacrifices. These verses refer to a curtain. That curtain is the curtain that divided the holy place from the most holy place. And when Jesus gave up his last breath on the cross, that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, therefore signifying that the way to God, the new and living way through the body of Jesus had been opened once and for all. And so the Hebrews, they had, and we have, a great and perfect priest, a great and perfect sacrifice, the one who gave up his life on the cross as the atonement for all our sins. And after he died, he arose. And after he arose, he entered into the heavenly holy of holies, the heavenly sanctuary, with his own perfect, eternal, precious blood. And he presented that before the Father, and atonement was made. And all who are united to this Christ by faith are free to walk right through that same door, right through that same torn curtain into the very presence of God, confidently and boldly. Not carelessly, God is yet God, but confidently and boldly. And it's in light of this awesome reality that the author of Hebrews gives these three callings in verses 22 to 24. And you might have noticed that these callings are centered on that well-known uh, triad, faith, hope, and love. Let us draw near in full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, it's tempting to address every part of this triad in detail. But I've been advised that wedding sermons are not supposed to be overly long. So we'll just focus on verse 23, the text you've chosen. The point is this, taking into account 19 to 21, verses 19 to 21. Uh, since Christ has won for us the right to become the children of God, to live in God's presence, since He freely receives us, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. One day, God will fulfill His promises and grant to us glory in His presence that we cannot even begin to describe in words. And James and Hannah and family and friends, 
We need to see the eternal perspective of this calling to hold fast. This calling is nothing like the false gospel that is promoted in so many places. The false gospel of your best life now, Jesus will release a blessing upon your life in the form of miracles. Money will flow, pain will be gone. No, we're called to hold fast, to hope, hope. Why? Because this present life is full of trials. For the Hebrews and for the worm brands and for others, this even meant persecution. It even meant torture. Therefore, because of the trials of this life, we need to be encouraged, exhorted to persevere by holding fast to the confession of our hope. Romans 8, 22 to 25 says it this way, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. As Christians, we are looking to the future, to the final fulfillment of God's promises, the gracious reward of our faith, a new heavens and a new earth, new bodies with no sickness, no more crying, no more pain, the presence of God who will dwell with us and wipe every tear from our eyes and be with us in a way that we cannot experience now, as good as it is to know Him now. And so this is Christian Hope, it by definition looks to the future, not with a faint wish, but with a sure and certain knowledge, a trust that God is faithful. He's going to bring these things about because He's promised. A preacher once told a story to illustrate uh, the faith of the Christian in light of the faithfulness of God, and it's worth repeating today. A father took a little boy and he left him on a corner and said, I'm going to go to a meeting be back in half an hour. And his car broke down somewhere, and he couldn't get to the boy, and he couldn't get to a phone, and he didn't know how he could call the boy. And three, four, five hours went by, and the little boy was on a corner in front of a dime store. And his father came back in a state of panic, finally, five hours later, after his car had been repaired, and the little fellow was just standing there, kind of rocking back and forth on his heels, looking in the window of the dime store. His dad ran out and threw his arms around him and kissed him and kissed him and said, Oh, weren't you worried? Weren't you worried? Did you think I was never coming? And the little guy looked him in the eye and said, No, Dad, I knew you were coming. You said you were. Boy, dads, I hope your kids feel that way about you keeping your word. But you see, that's how God is, you know. It may seem like a long time, and it may seem painful in the meantime, but he'll be there, and it'll be just like he said it would because he who promised is faithful. So the wait is worth it. Holding fast is worth it. It's worth it to follow Jesus Christ our Lord till the end of our days, in good days and bad, in riches and poverty, in health and sickness, for as long as we all shall live. James and Hannah, the faithfulness of God has to be the foundation of your marriage. It's hard to imagine today but your marriage will have trials. For example, there may be bad days, or poverty, or sickness. At minimum, there will be bad days. Now this is not at all to say that marriage is one bad day after another, not in the least. Uh, By God's grace, your marriage will be peaceful, glorious, productive, and fun. But there will also be bad days, whatever specifically that means for you. And especially on those bad days, you will need to trust the promise of God and the faithfulness of God. God's calling in your marriage is to be faithful to one another, to sacrificially love one another. And sometimes this is plain old hard work. You won't feel like it because your natural inclinations are strong. You will be cranky. You will be selfish. You will be impatient. You will be proud. Your spouse will have times when he or she isn't really living up to his or her calling. 
And you won't necessarily feel like it's fair for you to have to fulfill your vows. On those days, what is your motive to be faithful and to hold fast to one another, to love one another like Christ? Well, again, your motive is at the very bottom, God's faithfulness. Because God loves you eternally, and He always will. He, he has set His hand upon you. He has promised you the forgiveness of your sins, also your sins in marriage, and He is faithful to keep that promise. He has promised you an open door into His presence to help you in your time of need, and He is faithful to keep that promise. And He has promised to graciously reward your faithfulness to one another with eternal blessing, and He is faithful to keep that promise. So holding fast to each other in a Christian marriage means, first of all, holding fast to our eternal hope in God. It means trusting Him for His promises. We're getting near the end. Um, let's just briefly look at Hebrews 11, because in Hebrews 11, the very next chapter, we're told of the Old Testament patriarchs who were looking forward to a heavenly country. I'll just read a couple of sections. First of all, 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then verses 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Recently, a brother in the Lord was praying, and in his prayer, he spoke of marriage as a joyful pilgrimage. And isn't that an apt description of what James and Hannah are beginning today? A joyful pilgrimage. Their eyes are on each other, absolutely, but really, they are beginning a pilgrimage together, shoulder to shoulder, with their eyes on God and the hope that God has set before them. Like the Old Testament saints, uh, like Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, they need to learn to put everything else in second place. Their Christian hope, their attitude of joyful pilgrimage will give them the parameters for a marriage that flourishes, truly flourishes. James and Hannah, you will be able to hold to each other best when you hold to God first. You will be able to fulfill your vows of marriage when you found your marriage on the vows of God, as you are doing today. May your marriage be abundant, fruitful, joyful, and glorious to the praise of God. Amen. Let's now rise to sing from the next song in the program, Hymn 71.
Let's now proceed to the solemnization of marriage. For that purpose, we will read through the form for solemnization of marriage. If you would like to follow along in your book of praise, you can find that on page 628. James Hendrick Penninga and Hannah Gerilyn Slaw. Since the consistory has duly made known to the congregation your desire to enter into the married state and no lawful objection has been presented, we may now proceed to the solemnization of your marriage in the name of the Lord. Let us first listen to a summary of what the Word of God teaches us about marriage. We find there that marriage is an institution of God which pleases Him and must therefore be held in honor among all. After God our Father made heaven and earth, he created man in his own image. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We therefore believe that the Lord also today gives husband and wife to one another. Since they are united by his hand, nothing shall separate them in this life. Also, our Lord Jesus Christ honored marriage when he revealed his glory at the, wedding, the marriage feast at Cana. He teaches us that marriage is an institution of God and should not be broken when he said, What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Since God has made marriage such a strong bond, he hates divorce, as also our Lord Jesus Christ chose in these words, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. As the Lord forbids immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband, so that our bodies may be preserved as temples of the Holy Spirit, and we may glorify God in our bodies. The Apostle Paul teaches us that the unity of husband and wife in marriage is a profound mystery, reflecting the relationship between Christ and his church. As Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of his wife. Christ loved his church to the end and gave himself up for her, that she might be holy and without blemish. Likewise, the husband shall love his wife as his own body, take care of her and cherish her. As the church is subject to Christ, so the wife shall be subject in everything to her husband, respect him, and entrust herself to his loving care, following the example of godly women who trusted in God and were subject to their husbands. Husband and wife shall assist each other in all good things, heartily forgiving one another their sins and shortcomings. United in love, they will more and more reflect in their marriage the unity of Christ and his church. Although it is true, as the Apostle says, that those who marry will face trouble in this state, and because of sin will experience many difficulties and afflictions, yet they may also believe the promise of God that they, as heirs of the grace of life, will always receive his aid and protection, even when they least expect it. The Word of God also teaches us about the purpose of marriage. First, a husband and wife shall live together in sincere love and holiness, helping each other faithfully in all things that belong to this life and the life to come. Second, by marriage, the human race is to be continued and increased, and under the blessing of God, husband and wife will be fruitful and increase in number. If it pleases God to give them children, he shall nurture these children in the true knowledge and fear of the Lord. James and Hannah, I now invite you to rise and come forward.
Bridegroom and bride, hear from the word of God what the Lord requires of you in marriage. Bridegroom, know that God has set you to be the head of your wife. You shall love her as your own body, as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her. Guide, protect, and comfort your wife. Live with her wisely and honor her because she is an heir to eternal life together with you. Then your prayers will not be hindered. Work faithfully in your daily calling that you may support your family and also help those in need. Bride, you shall love your husband and be subject to him as the church is subject to Christ. Accept his guidance and assist him in all good things. Take proper care of your family and household and live modestly in faith, love, and holiness. Assist each other always and be faithful to each other. Diligently fulfill the calling which the Lord has given you in the church and in this world. Believe God's sure promise. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Psalm 128. James Hendrick Penninga and Hannah Geraldin Slaw, you have now heard what the Lord requires of you and what he has promised you. May our gracious God give you the strength and the faithfulness to live together as husband and wife in this manner, and may your help be in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Will you now join right hands? James, with... Uh, Using the microphone, uh, please repeat after me. Thank you. I, James Hendrick Penninga. I, James Hendrick Penninga. Declare here before the Lord and these witnesses. Declare here before the Lord and these witnesses. That I take as my lawful wife. That I take as my lawful wife. Hannah Geraldine Slaw here present. Hannah Geraldine Slaw here present. I promise to love and guide her faithfully. I promise to love and guide her faithfully to care for her to care for her and to live with her in holiness and to live with her in holiness according to the holy gospel according to the holy gospel I also promise never to forsake her I also promise never to forsake her but to be true to her always but to be true to her always in good days and bad in good days and bad in riches and poverty in riches and poverty in health and sickness in health and sickness for as long as we both shall live for as long as we both shall live and Hannah please repeat after me I Hannah Geraldine Slaw I Hannah Geraldine Slaw declare here before the Lord and these witnesses declare here before the Lord and these witnesses that I take as my lawful husband that I take as my lawful husband James Hendrick Penninga here present James Hendrick Penninga here present I promise to love and obey him. I promise to love and obey him. To assist him. To assist him. And to live with him in holiness. And to live with him in holiness. According to the holy gospel. According to the holy gospel. I promise never to forsake him. I promise never to forsake him. But to be true to him always. But to be true to him always. In good days and bad. In good days and bad. In riches and poverty. In riches and poverty. In health and sickness. In health and sickness. For as long as we both shall live. For as long as we both shall live. I now pronounce you husband and wife. The Father of all mercies, who by his grace called you to this holy state of marriage, bind you together in true love and faithfulness, and grant you his blessing. Amen. Could you please bring forward the rings? Thank you. James, do you give this ring to Hannah as a symbol of your constant love and abiding faithfulness? Hannah, do you give this ring to James as a symbol of your constant love and abiding faithfulness? James, you may kiss your bride. Well, shall we sing together from Psalm 134? Let's all rise to sing Psalm 134, verses 1 and 2.
please be seated. James and Hannah, since we cannot expect anything from ourselves, you shall kneel before the Lord and we shall pray with you and for you that he may enable you to fulfill your vows and grant you his blessing. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, you have said from the beginning that man should not be alone. We thank and praise you that you have given James and Hannah to each other in marriage, that they may be one. We pray that you would grant them your Holy Spirit, that they may live together according to your will and true faith. Help them to resist the power of sin and to live in holiness before you. Lift up your countenance upon them and guide them in prosperity and adversity by your fatherly hand. Grant them your blessing according to the covenant promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If it should please you to give them children, confirm your covenant to them and to their seed, and grant that they may nurture these children in the fear of the Lord to the glory of your name and to the edification of the church. Let them live in communion with your Son, Jesus Christ, in the harmony of true love and to the benefit of their neighbor. Cause them to look forward with all the church to the great day of the marriage feast of the Lamb. Hear us, merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, the only true God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. James and Hannah Slaw, our Lord God bless you richly and grant you a long and holy life together in all godliness, love, and unity. Amen. Let's now sing a song of blessing. Let's rise to sing the third verse of Psalm 134. I'll proceed to the signing of the marriage documents and despite my error in the blessing I would assure you that the documents have the correct name. Could I now invite you, uh, invite forward the maid of honor and the best man uh, for the signing. Stop. 
accomplish the work of our hands and order our steps to seek first your kingdom in every small and great task. May we live the gospel of your grace, serve your purpose in our fleeting days. Then our lives will bring eternal praise and all glory to your great name. And all glory to We now welcome forward James's elder, Ty Vorhorst, for the presentation of a wedding Bible. James and Hannah, it is my privilege to present you with this gift on behalf of Provisional Council and Prince George. It is our prayer that God's word will serve as guide for your lives and your marriage through whatever joys and challenges he will set for you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. And we now invite forward the wedding party and we invite the audience to rise and we'll sing the final song Hymn 83. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. James and Hannah Penninga. <laughs> <laughs> 